Setting up your meeting for YouTube Live. Cool. <clears throat> this many copies of the art and out i'm gonna to have to make sure i reach for the right oh, one right there um so if you're out there and you're waiting for us we're just preparing so give us a couple of seconds here to get all this right and i'm gonna do this and i'm popping out that and i'm moving that and i'm heading back to zoom and one second as i get the chat box going for everybody. All this exciting Zoom nonsense. There we are. Great. All right. So it's 11.58 now. If you're out there and uh, we're not quite live yet, we're going to start at 12, but we're just getting everything set up here. So if you're out there and you're waiting to come on and listen and to tune in, uh, we're going to start in just a minute uh, with Brush Up Your Shakespeare, uh, episode seven, live on YouTube. John, are you out there? John, John, John. I'm trying to get him to chat me something. <laughs> Just to make sure we're going. Is it noon yet? It's 11.59. One minute, everybody. 60 seconds and counting. We're going to start. We're just waiting for everybody to get in. You're watching the, the kind of pre-show warm up here as we uh, try to figure <laughs> out uh, how all this works. So you know, we continue our exploration of uh, Wayne's World Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, Deb says good morning. So I know we're there. Hey, Deb. Martin is out there. That's so great. Now, uh, even if only Hello. Deb is listening, that makes this show um, really worth doing. Uh, so we're going to wait and we're counting down 1159. We'll be there in probably 30 seconds and everything is looking good. John tells me, so that's good too. So any last minute prep, Nora, do it now. Oh, great. Good. Glad I got these 20 seconds. We need really, we need to get to, to go into, have some kind of title thing. And so we'll figure that out where every week it gets oh. a little bit. I have added a microphone this week, everybody. So maybe I'll sound a little bit better play free bird. Here it is. It's 12 o'clock. Hello, everybody. And welcome to episode seven of Brush Up Your Shakespeare here at YouTube Live, uh, GAN Theater YouTube Live channel. Um, and uh, another great uh, episode this week. Um, we have uh, here, as you're seeing on your screen. Uh, hi, for those of you, I don't know if anybody tuning in who hasn't tuned before. I'm Tony Estrella. I am the artistic director of the GAN Theater. And joining me for Brush Up Your Shakespeare this week is Nora Eschenheimer, uh, who is uh, a colleague, of, you know, long time ago, I like to say long time ago, it makes me feel younger, a former stu student, um, but also a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful actor who you've seen on the GAM stage and all over the place. Uh, and uh, most recently um, for us, uh, you have seen her as Rosalind and As You Like It, which we're going to talk about today as part of our discussion. Also uh, in importance of being earnest. Uh, also, um, most recently, for those of you who are Shakespeare fans, last summer, she played uh, Imogen in the Commonwealth Shakespeare's production of Cymbeline, which I was also so, um, you know, privileged to be in and to play her dad for, um, I think, the third yeah, time. The third the time third yeah. Time. Uh, and uh, in that production, Nora was uh, nominated um, for uh, best actor, uh, female actor in a role in a large company for her role as Imogen for the Elliot Norton Awards this past week. She did not win, um, but it doesn't matter. Her performance was uh, brilliant and, of course, an honor to be nominated and always has been an honor to work with her uh, for as long as I have known her since she was probably, I don't know, 18 or 19 um, and just starting out in Shakespeare. Uh, so uh, she's a terrific actor. And this week, um, someone says, uh, Isabel says, congrats on your Elliot Norton nomination. Absolutely, incredibly well-deserved. If you saw that show, uh, you know I'm not lying about that. Um, people, look at this, Nora. Nora, you look beautiful. You have a fan club going on. Wow. Them coming in. Someone just- I got to make sure I can see these chats. Yeah. Um, so yes, <laughs> definitely upping upping the, uh, the uh, um, kind of uh, uh, game here by bringing Nora in and not just staring at my old mug. So uh, what 
Nora is here to talk about Rosalind, as I said, and also to talk about, um, uh, we're gonna look at Viola and Twelfth Night as well. And overall, a couple of things we wanna get at this week uh, in this episode is about, as I promised in the promo, to talk about trouser rolls um, and, uh, and the special kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, part of the canon, uh, which includes those roles, uh, Rosalind and Violet, chief among them, which is why we picked those out. And then also, um, we're going to look at, as we've always tried to do, just want to remind everybody kind of what the uh, raison d'etre of this entire uh, operation is, which is to kind of bring us together as audience and actor, as audience and theater creators, um, to kind of uh, experience Shakespeare together in the present tense. You know, if we can discover this language together, and it comes alive to us in the room when we're all back in a room together, or even across this digital platform, then it becomes something very, very, very special. Uh, and so we're talking about techniques and things in Shakespeare's language that allow us as actors to do that better for you and allows you as audience to kind of engage that with less fear, less anxiety. And uh, this week, I think uh, by focusing on these two amazing roles, uh, we'll be able to get at that and something very particular um, that I think is important in Shakespeare, which is, um, as I always, uh, when I'm teaching, I, I, I think I've talked about this before but I like to use uh, as, a, as a kind of mnemonic device. And I talk about the C words, not that C word, but a C <laughs> word for the um, uh, students to remember and talk about what we do as actors. And among them, the first one, the most, uh, the, maybe not the most important, they're all important, but the first one is coining, right? Which means discovering. It means that, as we've talked about before, that the language is always happening in the present tense. It's being discovered by the actor and the audience at the same time. And if we can create that, if an actor can help an audience create that, then we've got something very special because we're all on that tightrope together and we're walking it, you know, and the drama can actually happen. And then we feel we're in the room. We're not either behind you know or in front of it we're right there and if we can occupy that present tense space we've got something really special and so we're going to kind of focus on that in a couple of wonderful speeches from these plays so uh first uh nora um tell us you've played you know we talk about these trouser roles could you tell us what are they and uh, who are they and what is the tradition over the course of uh, as, as you know it in the course of shakespeare's work well um so the trouser roles um most simply is when you have a female character put on the identity of a male. And this happens in five of Shakespeare's plays. Um, the first being uh, Julia and Two Gentlemen of Verona, which happens mm -hmm. in 1589. Um, then he sort of ups the ante a little bit with Portia, Portia in The Merchant of Venice. Right. Um, I'll also mention that there are three women who uh, dress the role of men in that show with Portia being sort of the lead, but then also Nerissa, her lady in waiting, and Jessica. Um, mm -hmm. But then we and famously, fast forward. Nora, if I could, no, no, what's the and and it's uh, Portia's most famous speech comes when she's in her guise, right? Yes, yes, the quality of mercy. Right. So those of you who don't know Merchant of Venice, the quality of mercy is not strained. Very famous speech comes when she's in her guise, as often happens with these roles. They 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 they, they say their most uh, profound things when they're kind of hiding a little bit. Yeah, we'll talk. Right. About yeah, I love that. So, yeah, discovering of self. And it turns out in most of these cases that these women are able to be more themselves when they are in the disguise of men, mm -hmm. um, which makes them so fun to play. Yeah. Uh, in 1599, this is when Shakespeare, you know, has so many of his great shows come out, but um, he writes in 1599, as you like it, Julius Caesar and Henry V um, and creates Rosalind in mm -hmm. As You Like It. And she is what I would describe as the quintessential trouser role um, because not only is she a woman who dresses as a man, um, but it really is about, it's a journey of self-discovery um, and of independence. And it's uh, a lot about getting to know yourself through the disguise. And once that character knows themselves, they can open their hearts to someone else. Um, mm -hmm. After 1599, we hit uh, Viola just two years later um, in Twelfth Night in 1601. Um, another genius character, um, a little more heart sick, I guess we could say. And then, uh, much later, uh, 10 years later, we have Imogen and Cymbeline. So mm -hmm. do you start, that's sort of like the timeline of Shakespeare's trouser roles. And, and so over the past uh, couple of years, you've played those last three, right? I've been really fortunate that in, yeah, in just two years I've played, I've gone from playing Rosalind to Imogen to Violet. 
Um, Bio so is I have, most, the most recent, yeah. Most recent, yeah. Right. So it's it's nice to be like I have I have some understanding of how these women work. Um, you, I'm you, no and yeah, expert. wearing wearing pants, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's and great I think to, those journeys no, that's, are that's, the best. Yeah, and so yeah, the, um, the journey of self discovery. Now, when we were working on As You Like It, those of you who know that play, um, you know, uh, or, or saw our production, um, you know, that production was very much formally interested in um, the idea of the trouser role being, uh, of course, starting um, the kind of um, uh, the gender exploration of it, uh, because Shakespeare's company, of course, was all male. Right. So then you have this layering upon layering of disguise that happens, which, of course, culminates in the end of that play with this brilliant, weird um, epilogue that Ro Rosalind speaks as the actor. It would have been a boy actor at the time. Right. Kind of disrobes from the several disguises that he has worn over the course of that performance. Um, and uh, and so it's a, it's it's important to remember that as um, you know, because Shakespeare was already starting from a place where he understood the strength of that he, or we might not see it as a strength to have a unisex uh, cast or a, a, a monosex cast, um, but uh, he used it to his advantage theatrically, right? So, uh, and especially I think the most in the most acute way with, with As You Like It, but certainly also in Twelfth Night. Now, looking at Violet and Rosalind together is really interesting. You've played them both recently and um, we wanna talk about a little bit about what they share as characters and then where they part. You know, Nora and I were chatting about this a little bit and it always strikes me that in their guises um, as, uh, as young men um, that uh, uh, they take to their roles a little bit differently. Would you like, Nora, what, what what do you think ultimately is the you know maybe separates them in their kind of taking on of their of the male uh, guys? Well, I think uh, for Rosalind, I mean she's certainly liberated by the disguise of Ganymede. So she puts mm -hmm. on the men's clothing and she revels in it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think Viola, it takes her a little more time to to warm up to the male disguise. Um, she does have the line of uh, disguise, I see thou art a wickedness. Right. And uh, whereas Rosalind never really refers to that disguise as something that's inhibiting her. Right. Um, that's, what I yeah. think, yeah, what I think is similar between the two roles is that really not only are these stories of self discovery, um, but in both As You Like It and in Twelfth Night, you have a uh, a female protagonist who's essentially teaching their the person they love the in Viola's case Orsino in Rosalind's case or Orlando um, but they're teaching th those men how to love um, more honestly um, and how to and how to change romanticized love Orlando pinning letters on a tree and saying like this is this is what love is, and then of course Orsino, who says, <clears throat> "My love is the is the most profound love," um, and both of them sort of instruct the men that it love is more complicated, and in order for it to be enduring, it has to be more honest. And clearly, the suggestion being in the guys, right, is that 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 these characters are able to kind of do what art does for us, right? Which is allows us to imagine ourselves into somebody else and to see something from a 360 degree perspective versus our kind of own myop myopic point of view, right? Um, correct, Viola does say, disguise thou art a wickedness. And I'd like to start with that speech if we could. For those of you uh, yeah. who don't know Twelfth Night, I would recommend you go out and read it uh, or see a production. There was just one uh, that I think it's off now. I think you probably missed it if you didn't get to see it, but some of you may have seen the uh, National Theater Live uh, streaming uh, broadcast of it from the, uh, um, that was up last week or the week before, I believe. Um, but there's kind of free theater everywhere uh, over the past couple of months. So uh, you might be able to find a production out there that you can watch or certainly read the play, it's beautiful. Um, but just to give you a little context in this and to kind of put Violet and Rosalind together, they are both um, characters who are thrust into crisis immediately, right at the top of both of these plays. We know in Twelfth Night, Viola is, has just been victim of a shipwreck in which um, uh, she, with her brother, uh, her twin brother, who she believes uh, is dead. 
um, and she washes up on the shore of Illyria, um, a foreign land, and has to make her way. And so what she does to make that way is she's, you know, in danger. So she says, I better, um, you know, uh, put on uh, uh, my brother's clothes and uh, try to make my way through the world. And because I will be victim, right? Uh, a, a woman alone, a young woman alone in a foreign land, not a good thing. Uh, Rosalind similarly is exiled from the court. Uh, and this um, is chased basically out into the woods, uh, into the forest where she has to don a guise as well of a, shepherd, a young shepherd in order to kind of mix in to protect again against um, the, not only the, 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 the kind of the human danger, but also in, in as you like it, there's a, a, a kind of natural dangers out in the woods as well. Um, so that's like a little bit of context. So right here, we're at the beginning of the play and Viola has gotten a job. She's very quick. She put on, that's all it takes. She put on a, put, put on a trousers and some boots and she goes out and she gets a job as um, basically a messenger for um, uh, the Duke Orsino, who she uh, will tell us and immediately has kind of fallen for. He sees her as a young man and he says, well, this kid, I like this kid. I'm going to send him to do my bidding in order to go and meet the woman I love and try to convince her that she should love me as well. Um, so Viola has just done that, gone to meet with uh, Olivia uh, to, to express Orsino's love. And unfortunately, um, something else happened, which this speech kind of um, tells us about. So here, Viola has left. She's confused. Malvolio, we talked about last week in our last episode, um, has uh, returned a ring to her that Olivia has sent. I'm um, saying this, th th this young man left me a ring tell him to take it back. I don't want it unless he wants to come in. It's from the Duke, et cetera. Uh, Malvolio gives her the ring. Of course, that was a lie. He didn't, Viola left no ring with her, she says. <laughs> um, and this is clearly a ploy on Olivia's part to get Viola back because something has happened between the two of them um, in this, in the previous scene. And this speech is a revelation of that. So as we were talking about, we really want to think about self-discovery in this and the discovery in the present tense of what's happening. And as Viola puts this plot together, we're able to put the plot together with her. And not only just what's happening, but also more importantly, the stakes rise. We rise together right. with the stakes and we see um, how, uh, how dangerous dangerous, how important, how lovely, how thrilling, how um, powerful uh, the story can be revealed in the speech. So Nora, let's just start. We'll work through a little bit and we'll talk about different parts of it uh, and uh, talk about how Shakespeare helps us with this and uses the language. So uh, starting with the, I left no ring with her. What means? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, of course, discovering of the ring. And I think this is where we get sort of the, the idea that catapults the rest of the um, monologue. Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. And then we start building the, the ideas. She made good view of me. Indeed so much me thought her eyes had lost her tongue for she did speak in starts distractedly. And then like exclam exclamation point, she loves me. Um, uh, what I love is- Go ahead. Is, oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, she loves me, sure. Right, sure. which seems me. to say she loves me. Sure, wait a minute. There's still more to work out here, right? Right. So yeah. Very, Shakespeare gives us two revelations in the beginning of this. Wait a minute. I think she loves me. The sure gives us enough length to keep going before we get to the big one. So Nora, just take a run at it right from the beginning, and let's go through. Um, uh, I am the man. Yeah. Uh oh, sure. Okay, cool. Um, I left no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. She made good view of me. Indeed, so much me thought her eyes had lost her tongue, for she did speak in starts distractedly. She loves me. Sure, the cunning of her passion invites me in this churlish messenger. None of my lord's ring. Why? He sent her none. I am the man. Good, good, good. And we got to be careful in there not to play that too early, right? And I think where, where we could help the audience a little bit more right now is making sure we're telling the story of Malvolio, right? Right. That Malvolio is the churlish messenger. And then that's a new element that this just happened. What the hell was that? Yeah. And then I can get through to um, uh, uh, none of my Lord's ring, right? which is something, yeah. is it quoting, right? None of my, what, that doesn't make any sense to me. So you can discover that more. I didn't give her one. <gasps> and then what? we get the no, thing, oh, right? Sure. Yeah, then it comes I'm, in. We sent her none. I am the man. And I right. love that, the monosyllabic of um, yeah. I am the man too. Yeah. 
Um, and then it, and then and then we get the, then the speech really hinges on that discovery, and we go to a different place because then it becomes the thesis statement changes from what's going on to I have a new identity. I am the man versus she loves me, sure, right? Which is partly she loves me because she thinks I'm something I'm not, but I am the man. Now, for those of you who are, are fond of um, uh, romantic uh, teen comedies, um, that might ring a bell to you. There's a, there's a, from about 15 years, 10, 15, I don't even know how long ago, She's the Man is a high school version of Twelfth Night, which echoes that line. And I think it was pretty popular back about a, a decade or so ago. Um, so yeah, I am the man. And then the speech takes a different, so it's a speech of discovery, right? Of what yeah. just happened, putting the plot together. And then with the revelation of identity comes an interrogation of the internal, which comes next. And the speech really shifts gears here. The whole thing is in verse, right? But the ideas all of a sudden, all we were very naturalistic verse in this beginning, right? And now yeah. we've got a register shift into something that becomes more poetic. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I left no ring with her, so. Uh, just oh my like God, yeah. Like, what, what are you talking about? I left no ring with her, what means this lady? Oh my God, it's so natural, right? Yes, it's in that rhythm, but I left no ring with her, what means this lady? All monosyllables, right? It couldn't be, yeah. it sounds like it was written yesterday, yeah? Right. And we use fortune and charms. We don't use fortune, but you know, fortune forbid, goodness forbid, that my yeah. outside have not char charmed her. She made good view of me indeed, right? This is all such like modern contemporary language that sure methought her eyes had lost her tongue. Now we don't say methought that much anymore, yeah. but we get it, I thought. You know, right, that he just tongue. started to like, she did speak and starts distractedly, which of course is like stuttering and stumbling all over. Yeah, language. you haven't had term to, to, you know, time to process this, right? I mean, it's just been like, I just left and then this, I got followed by this crazy guy and he's a jerk and he threw a ring at me and I don't even know what it is. And it's like, what is this thing, you know? And I, I think it's the this. last thing she's expected too. Right. She's like, this lady just fell in love with me? Oh yeah. no. Right. And of course it, it culminates in like the best uh, rhyming couplet because it's just the- Nothing uh, to be done as Samuel Beckett would say, right? So, right. So let's, so this first part of it, she loves me, sure. All of it is very, very naturalistic. And then we get from, now let's see how the language changes here from I am the man, the discovery of this and how deep this has to strike her. I often find with this speech, when I see it sometimes, I think sometimes the actor stays in this kind of um, very naturalistic place with the second half of the speech and it becomes almost casual. And I'm thinking, well, wow, this is an unpacking of a kind of um, uh, idea of identity that Shakespeare is getting at, um, you know, like Rosalind, that really needs a little bit more time for us to stay with uh, the actor here playing Viola. So let's look at it from, let's just take the beginning of this from I am, after I am the man, you've just made the revelation, <gasps> I am the man, if it be so. Yeah, if it be so, as tis, poor lady, she would better love a dream. Disguise, I see thou art a wickedness. Wearing Good, a now, now we gotta stop there for a second, okay? I think that's great. None, uh, I am, if it be so, as tis, still natural, poor lady. All of a sudden, I think that the onomatopoeia of this needs to be, we need to find the balance here. Poor lady, she were better love a dream, a right? Dream. And dream, yeah. exactly. You did that beautifully in your voice. And I think that kind of, it needs to be something bigger there, right? And then the big word is the next one, right? Disguise. Disguise. Whatever this, this I is. did this. I made yeah. this happen. Disguise. So you have to, so in that present tense of like looking at yourself, what is, what are you doing? Like, what, how does that word, how do you use those syllables? Dis, guys, very different than dream, right? Yeah, so it, yeah. lots of the hissing dream is so open and like carrying, whereas disguise is, it, yeah. And, and what you just, then, then you start with those S's that hissing and you really hiss at the end of the verse line, right? Disguise, yeah, wickedness. A wickedness, so, yeah. yeah. What a great word to choose. That D disguise. comes back to disguise. I see thou art a wickedness. Yeah, so we have to kind of allow that versus the dream. You did that so beautifully in your voice, the way it kind of came out and it felt so the longing was evident. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, nah. you know what I mean? What is going on? Here is the drama. Here is the conflict. Yeah. So can you take that again, just from um, uh, poor lady, she would better love a dream disguise. Let's see if we can get that transition. If it be so as tis, poor lady. She would better love a dream. Disguise, I see thou art a wickedness. 
We're in the pregnant enemy does much. Okay, good. Right there. Now that's a big thing. We're in the pregnant enemy does much. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, woof. Well, the Arden, right? What does the Arden <laughs> tell us? Yes. What do the notes say? It's always good, everybody. Read your notes. Sometimes they help. And then it's our job to translate all of this work we do. And so that the audience does not have access to the notes and they shouldn't. So we've got to find a way, especially when Shakespeare gets a little bit intense with his imagery, how do we make that idea land? So what, what is it? The first thing we do is ask, what does he mean by this metaphor, the pregnant enemy? It's a great, listen to that pregnant enemy. Isn't that a great combination of syllables, right? Pregnant, a lot of the same vowel sounds, enemy. We get that N twice in a row, enemy, pregnant enemy. Oh, it's a, it's a mouthful. But if we let it go by like it's naturalistic, the audience will never have time to even think of what just, and it might as well have meant something else, right? So what, let's and start I, with that. Well, with the word pregnant, I, I, it's always tricky to use the word pregnant now because pregnant today really means the one thing, which is like with child. Back then, yeah. pregnant really was like with anticipation or like with ready. anticipation, right? Yeah. Right. So Imogen has a line, pregnant, pregnant, which is her being yeah. like, oh, it here, like with yeah. anticipation anticipation um yeah. and then like this meaning the pregnant enemy so like the ready the ready devil is sort mm. of they're saying enemy the devil um uh or enemy of mankind and pregnant here meaning ready or receptive right. the receptive devil and what's pregnant right and and it's a great word for shakespeare to choose because it did mean the same thing in his day in terms of uh, being with child because we're talking about something inherently about her femininity so that yeah. connotation is great but then putting enemy next to it automatically makes us so even if we don't quite get all of that because it's going fast we hear the 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 devil in the details as you say you know what i mean and so i think that's really important there that we but we have to slow that down a little bit if we go through yeah. and say the pregnant enemy doth much don't get it the pregnant enemy and so that sense of Remember, right, that Viola is coining this to go back to our theme here as it's coming. She, like she doesn't know what's coming next. So we can't take for granted what's coming next. And I always find it that's such a gift to an actor to say, because, oh, I can take advantage of that with the, the more intense poetic passages, because when I'm coining and discovering in the moment, I'm actually slowing down just enough to give the audience time. I always like to use a word when I'm, when I'm thinking about acting Shakespeare, which is, is sustain, you know? And I think we've talked about this before, but it's the idea that, especially in verse, that we you know vowel sounds and consonants that we think about sustaining, right? Like I just did, I could say sustain or I could say sustain. And just by adding that extra quarter note to the vowel, you know, I'm expressing something emotionally, I'm expressing something content wise, but I'm also allowing just with an extra beat there, right? An audience to be with me, to stay with me to not get too far ahead of them. You know, as I do, I tend to speak very rapidly as I am right now. I need to sustain more to land, to allow it to land, to allow the audience to experience it with me. And I think pregnant enemy could I use that. Enemy. Yeah. Yeah, so great. Discover that, always discover the hard stuff. Yeah. Great, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, From disguise. Disguise, disguise, I see thou art a wickedness, wherein the pregnant enemy does much. Don't go down at the end there though too, right? There's the other yeah. thing that sometimes we do. It's like where the end of the line is does much, right? The pregnant does enemy much. does much. Yeah, it yeah, does it does, like, wow. Yeah. The devil is, yeah, like here he, he's ready. Or and the pregnant thing, enemy does much. Yeah, this is a thing that happens oftentimes on stage. Now we're we're a little bit constrained here by the Zoom platform, right? It's a very, <laughs> it's a film platform. But on stage, it's so important for actors and audiences to be hearing to the end of the verse line that that the inflection and the energy always moves forward because it keeps our ear alive. We tend in life, in our contemporary lives, to kind of we go down at the end of our lines and blah, 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 you know. And what we do uh, when you know what we're saying subconsciously when we do that is it's not quite important what I'm saying, you know. Versus I've got something else to come. Wherein the pregnant enemy does much. Does much. What's right. next? Here, you know, to building to the next idea right. of her saying like, "Wow, and how easy, yeah, mm -hmm. how easy is it for the proper false." So it's, and of course, and the, the devil has it so easy because here we are. How easy is it for the proper false in women's waxen hearts to set their feet? 
Good. Now that's a really poetic image, right? So we kind of teased with pregnant enemy and that's got to be balanced against proper false, right? Because there's a reason those P's are there too, right? That he's actually recalling, you know, syntactically in our ear, that same sound. So we had the, wherein the pregnant enemy does much, you know, new thought, how easy discover it is, right? For the proper false, that's a paradox, yeah? yeah and if right, we don't, right, yeah, yeah. you've got to discover that in order for the audience, yeah, to be able to hear it and go, wow, proper false. I, I, can, I can take on the weight of that idea if I'm given time to hear it, yeah? If we just go again, how, we whack, how easy is it for the proper false in women's wax and hearts? I don't get it. How easy is it for what? Ask myself the question, the proper false oh, in women's yeah, not waxing. The right person. Yeah, waxing. The wrong person has set themselves and, here. And how do I say wax? How can I help the audience with wax to get the image of the melting? Yeah, and I think with that sustaining, right? Every time you sustain that vowel, you're pulling out the onomatopoeia of, um, yeah, so waxing. Waxing yeah. allows you to see like, okay, this is somebody dripping wax onto a, onto a letter and sealing it like that's right. the image so it's also yeah. the wax in hearts the melting right that that it's the that we can that, that that's moldable right and and our, our our hearts are delicate be kind because they break right yeah? yeah and and this is what she gets to here in the speech it, since she realizes i am the man it sends her into a much much deeper place on the nature of what that actually means who we are you know and the differences, the kind of societal differences between, or at least stereotypical societal differences between men and women, and that the disguise, the wickedness allows her to discover from the outside in. It's like having the third eye that's watching you and says, I can see now, it gives me perspective on something. And I understand through Olivia, and Olivia is falling in love with me, how easy it is, right? And yeah. I'm in the same place, right? And this is always a combination. Both of these women in this play, for those of you who don't know Twelfth Night, Viola and Olivia are in the exact same place. They both lost brothers recently and are in mourning. Um, one uh, clearly in mourning, she's wearing mourning. She's in black all the time. She has yet to thaw. And we just watched her thaw for the first time based on words that came from Viola's heart. Uh, yeah. the famous speech, the Willow Cabin speech. Yeah. Um, so it's like in that, uh, in my favorite Christmas special when the winter guy kind of, you know, he, he melts and becomes a human, you know, it's like, it's, um, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And, and she, it's just catching up with Viola now, what she is responsible for in allowing this, her heart to accept another's and what the, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, David Milch says that the original his, his his to him original sin is the violation of a sanctity of another's heart, and now that Olivia understands she ha Viola understands she has Olivia's heart, she has to work hard not to violate the sanctity of that, even though it's an impossible relationship, and that's drama, right? That's amazing. Yeah, does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, uh, <laughs> In, so to women's hearts to set their form. So this waxen thing to set their forms around to all of a sudden go, my heart is yours, right? Is that I, what that means? Well, yeah, set their, and it's with the proper false, right? So the, yeah. the wrong seal has been stamped on the letter. How easily mm. because our, of our hearts. I was telling you this earlier, but how Judy Dench just had her um, interview of, on Vogue and right. when somebody asked her what would you tell your younger self her response was i would i would tell my younger self to not fall in love so much and it's like here we are how easy is it mm -hmm. um uh for the proper false and women's wax and hearts to set their forms right and um, if we didn't alas, fall in love so much we wouldn't have drama right alas our frailty is the cause uh, alas our frailty is the cause, not we. Yeah, and so that's that's why is it frailty, not we? Our frailty no. that may could be, I think, you know, thought of as oh, well, he, Shakespeare's saying women are weaker and they can't. I don't think that's at all. There's something precious about that frailty. It's a frailty that Judy is saying I don't want because it means I'm gonna my heart's gonna break. Versus, it's actually what it means to be human, right? Yeah. Is to have that frailty and. 
we don't need to put on a man's kind of guys, you know, the you know, masculinity in order to pretend that's not there, you know, as, you know, a man, right? There's, uh, we contend with that in a different way where it's like, I am the frailest of frail and yet I have to go out and I have to pretend like I'm not, which is why, you know, we die of a heart attack at 45. You know, it's like, it's because it's, it's we all have that. And that frailty is not, sh we have to somehow color, I think, frailty so that yeah. it's not um, seen as a weakness, but as a strength. That yeah. frailty is actually a superpower. You know, right. it allows you to enter the heart of another and not to violate its sanctity. And yeah. if there's any, if what else is art for, right? Um, you know, if not that, yeah. So frailty is another big one, yeah. So alas, and you get that sigh, right? So the right. whole line is a sigh, yeah. So can you just take that line for us, alas? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such we are made of, such we be. Yeah, for such as we are made of, right? So such as we are for made such of. As such as we are made of. I should yeah. read the script, huh? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> please. No, but that rhythm is great. For such as, she's really making this kind of simile here, right? Such as yeah. we are made of, such, such we be. And all of those deliberate kind of slow um, single uh, syllables, right? Yeah. It's so the discovery, you can take your time with that discovery. There it is, you know, I am this. I am fragile, I am frail, I, because I am open to another. And that's not, that defines who she is, you know? Um, it's amazing in this play that despite the fact that she's, she never thinks she's gonna get her love, she will, she never, she gets jealous once, right? But she never quite allows that jealousy, a hu very human thing to over, um, to cloud her compassion and empathy for what Olivia is going through. Um, it's it quite a, it's why she's, she's a heartbreaker. She's, she's, she's empathy kind of on detonate, you know? Um, yeah, it's an, it's amazing, amazing, amazing. So, um, so then <laughs> the greatest word in the world comes up. Yeah. Then you've, now you've got a, now we've had two sections of this speech is so wonderful. If you've never read it starts with the kind of naturalistic, what the hell is going on? <gasps> I know what's going on. What does that mean? Existential. Right. And then she minds what that means and goes through all of this doesn't really come up. There's no solution. Right. So she has to ask the question, which she asked, what does she say? How will this fadge? Fadge? What the hell does fadge mean? Yeah. Well, uh, how will this turn out? Says right. Arden. But like how, what it's almost, I mean, uh, yeah, fadge is right. so great. It's just like, what it doesn't happening? right. It's not even a word. I don't even know if it was a word then. It's so perfect though. And there's never been an audience in the history of Shakespeare who has heard that and not understood exactly what she's saying. And if she yeah. said, how will this turn out, dud, right? Yeah. You know, how will this <laughs> fadge is so, it's like she's like nonverbal utterance, right? It's so delightful. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, the audience usually laughs like idiots when that happens. They hear the word fadge and they go, that's exactly what I'm feeling right now. I would say fadge, even though I've never heard the word before, you know? Right. Sometimes we just make shit stuff up, right? You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, and it's great. Um, let's look, well, there's a couple questions here. Sure. Um, and see what we got. Isabel asks, do you think that when this play is set in present day, it shifts the juxtaposition of gender in order to more equate the auton autonomy of each gender, specifically Olivia and Cesario's autonomy? Hmm. In the, it shifts the juxtaposition of gender. Um, I guess, um, I don't know that the shifting, you rarely see um, uh, productions of, uh, occasionally, I know there was a Mark Rylance production uh, recently uh, from the Globe that was, uh, you know, done with all men, and, um, but they were playing the characters as written. Um, so I'm not sure how the present day affects this as much um, in terms of specifically Olivia and Cesario's kind of autonomy. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, uh, a wonderful, um, you know, that scene between Act Two, Scene Four, with with Orsino and Cesario, it's which is Violet in the guise of the young man or the eunuch, um, is really a mess because they fall in love in that scene, despite the fact that they're not necessarily, at least consciously, attracted. Or Orsino's not necessarily consciously, in his mind, thinks of he's attracted to the young man, and he still is. Um, and it just shows us that love is something that permeates far deeper than gender constructs allow, right? 
Um, so how will this fadge? What is the problem? Now she's going to go back to naturalism here, which is great. We get away yeah. from the poetry a little bit to explain to us exactly. Now we've got to move the play forward. What does she say? Right. So now she has, yeah. How will this fadge? My master loves her dearly. And I, poor monster, again, with the beautiful poor monster. monster. Uh, oh. And uh, she's a monster because she's not what she's supposed to be. She's right. a thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I, poor monster, fawn as much on him. And she, mistaken, seems to dote on me. What will become of this? As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. Don't go down to the end of that, right? For my master's love. Yes, as I, I need am that, woman, yeah. yeah, as I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. As I am woman, now will last the day. Now, no, so see, all right, let's go back on that because I think it, it now, as I am man, my state is, as I am woman, there's a dash and it's in the middle of a line. Um, and so it doesn't have an end break, but I think without a, some kind of acknowledgement of the, <gasps> what am I gonna do? I ha as I yeah. am woman is a dot, dot, dot. She doesn't have, she doesn't complete the thought. We have to complete it for you. So you have to give us time to do that. Yeah, Great. can you take yeah. that again? Yeah. As, as I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. As I am woman, now alas the day. Alas the day, and don't let that go down. <gasps> you know, no, it's like, it's like not the, yeah, exactly. Zoom is making us yeah. take this down a little bit versus, <laughs> oh my God, what am I gonna do, right? Yeah. Oh. It hurts. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna reach down into your your innards and pull it all up, and it just like it's like your stomach clenches at that point, right? Alas, right, the yeah. day. It's the second alas of the speech. So right. the price of poker never goes down, right? So the first yeah. sigh was, huh? This one has to be crack my heart, you know, break. Yeah, heart, break, yeah? because she's now, as you were saying, like she's inflicting pain on another. Now, yeah. now, alas, the day. What thriftless sighs shall poor Olivia breathe? And the poor, again, that's like the third or fourth time in the speech we've heard that word. Poor yeah. monster, poor Olivia. It's not me, it's her, right? It's her now. Oh, yeah, yeah, poor Olivia, breathe. Uh, and then, of course, the best rhyming couplet ever. Um, oh, time. Oh, time. Thou must untangle this, not I. Tis too hard a knot for me to untie. And I think in all of the canon, that may be the most relevant Shakespearean couplet right now to the situation we're in. Almost it's every too day. Hard enough. All, too almost hard every enough. day, I say, oh, time. I repeat this line in my head because I try to come up with a plan that's somehow going to deal with all this in my life and in our lives. And we all do this every day and we are seem to be helpless against it. So if there could be any Shakespeare's relevance is constantly coming through always because he's such a great uh, anatomizer of the human condition which is tough <laughs> Sad, right <laughs> right um so yeah untangle is so great what do you untangle a web right a, a net um it's a great and word we can't kind of that must untangle is a word that we don't want to just run through right untangle because if we say if we give the audience time if we discover untangle we hear we have time for them to make the net image yeah untangle yeah. this not i it is too and hard not for me to untie, you know, and we embrace, of course, the the uh, the rhyme at the end because it's the button that launches us into the next scene. It's like the end of the song and the musical, right? And um, the double of the knot, right? Thou must untangle this, comma, not I, but the knot of, yeah. um, it is too hard a knot for me to untie. He loves doing right? that too, yeah. It's just fun. He's having fun with the words, yeah. Um, uh, Millie asked, Nora, uh, truth time, which of the three you have played so far, Rosalind, Imogen, or Viola, was your favorite to play, cast and director um, aside? Just for you, don't worry about anybody else's uh, um, thinking about it. Which Rosalind. one's your favorite? What? Absolutely. I, I have to say Rosalind, hands down. And the reason is because Rosalind is the only one who gets to run off into the woods and play Robin Hood and Maid Marian all in the same show at right. the same time. And I think that's, I mean, that's what makes her such a delight to play. Yeah, um, what, yeah, what a great segue. Thank you, Millie, for affording you, us Millie. that as we start to look at Rosalind a little right, bit. As we and, yeah, yeah. And um and so and Rosalind is often, you know, talked about as Nora has just said, um, you know, uh a, a role um I will never uh 
get to play and um, um, uh, you know certainly would would kill to anybody would um, it's uh, um, and it's one of those uh, you know it's Hamlet it's you know Lear it's Cleopatra it's 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 you know the kind of one of the crown jewels of in all of theater for many of the reasons that we've kind of already started to talk about and I think I love that the, the, the Maid Marian and Robin Hood all at once yeah who wouldn't want to be that right um, oh, and that. you're right but in this the, the, we were chatting earlier about the the, the, diff, the similarities and differences between these two characters and we've just kind of watched um, a very uncertain uh, scared, anxious, brave, you know, um, uh, Viola trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. She takes to her role in a much more trepidatious way where, like you say about Robin Hood, where it seems like, uh, and as you like it, when Rosalind becomes Ganymede, right. Uh, um, who is the, 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 the male version of her, uh, out when she, and liberated in the woods, she's like the, the world's greatest method actor. She goes to a place where she convinces herself, you know, she's like, I don't know, um, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, Michael Fassbender and, um, uh, you know, that's Steve McQueen's The Hunger, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, you know, she does everything. All of a sudden she's like, she becomes him, you know what I mean? In a way yeah. that is, is marrow deep. Can you talk about that well, a little think, bit? Well, yeah, I think that Rosalind is, she, Rosalind is more Rosalind when she's Ganymede. And I think it's not necessarily that I think part of it is that she's discovering who Ganymede is and she gets sort of lost in the magic of what it is to be another um, gender and all of the freedoms that are associated with that. Also all the freedoms that come with like reinventing yourself. Like she, her, Celia is the only individual really with her um, and their fool, but uh, who, who knows who Rosalind really is. So Rosalind gets to sort of like reinvent herself in the woods and um yeah i think when she becomes ganymede she's actually just drawing out all of her the personality that she's always wanted to express um and it sort of manifests in this in the you know as her being uh ganymede or yeah so ganymede. so quickly context wise she's gone out into the woods um she's and she's been exiled she's in uh, immense danger she's left with her cousin celia and their fool touch tone um, and they are not used to the woods at all. Uh, so they, yeah. these are these are court court people. These are city folk, uh, and so they get out there and they're trying to act like they're shepherds. Um, and and at one point uh, in midway through the play, they uh, run into um, a couple of shepherds, uh, a shepherd and a shepherdess. Uh, one who is desperately in love with the other, and the other who the the female the shepherdess who uh, Phoebe who um, uh, despises and abuses poor little Silvius, the shepherd who <laughs> follows her around um, like a puppy dog. Um, and uh, Rosalind witnesses this in her guise as Ganymede uh, and is uh, immediately sides with Silvius. Um, who is a broken and open wound, poor little Silvius, with the most some of the most beautiful uh, verse in the play. He's a romantic who is constantly uh, allowing his heart to be stepped on and crushed. And Rosalind thinks she can come to his rescue in the guise, in this male guise, in which she explores in this speech, we'll look at um, uh, uh, it, uh, cruelty as well and uh, aggression. And uh, one of the things that maybe putting on a pair of pants you know, and squaring your shoulders in a world um, allows you to do and finding that power and how intoxicating that power can be and also destructive, right? Yeah, um, I would yeah. say that Rosalind jumps into this, right? The reason, the thing that spurs her into even interjecting is it's coming from a, a place of heartache, right? Yeah. So just before this happens, Orlando has been a no-show. They've set yeah. up this thing, Orlando's gonna show up, Ros Rosalind's going, as Ganymede is going to pretend to be Rosalind. This is why it's the best role ever. Um, Rosalind as Ganymede is going to pretend to be Rosalind and woo Orlando and that's going to cure him. And Orlando is a no-show and Rosalind is just heartbroken. Um, so then to see um, Phoebe just absolutely ripping apart poor Silvius, right. um, that it, it uh, sort of triggers Rosalind in a way that I think it wouldn't necessarily in other um, parts of the play. Mm. Um, and this yeah. is in response, this first line is in response to Phoebe. It's like, who do you think you are, right? Yeah. And why, I pray you. Yeah, who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the mm, wretched. And we made a choice there that make yeah. that wretched one syllable 
um, the way the line scans, it goes, over the wretched, what though you have no beauty. Again, we're now in verse. So this is actually a, uh, this is a treat for Rosalind because she lives in prose world so much. Right. So for Rosalind to have verse, um, yeah. it means that it's more um, planned and deliberate, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And also like sort of showing her, she's she's really trying on that, that masculinity. Yeah, this. this is a, this is like her um, debut performance, right? I mean, this is like she's performing yeah. for the first time for other people now. You know what I mean? In a way that's like, she's getting used to this. It's like, oh, I I feel pretty good as a man now, and I'm gonna kind of show. I'm gonna sow my oats here. Um, so yes, yeah, so that you're absolutely right. That's a great insight. So uh, I love that you brought that up. Um, obviously, when we see on the page W R E T C H E D, we read wretched, right? And the line would work right over the wretched. What though you have no beauty, it's just off a little bit on the, uh, and oftentimes it's played that way. It's just not what Shakespeare wrote. And we could say wretched because it's kind of is more flattering to the contemporary ear. But when we were working on it and we chose wretched, there's something about saying that that is such right. a- yeah. yeah, it's vile. It sounds yeah. like, I mean, she looks at poor Sylvius and it's just like, what is this character? Wretched, like yeah. run out. Oh yeah. Just it's Done. kind of, it, it becomes like fadge. It's just such a great thing to get your mouth around and expresses yeah. itself in its, in, uh, you know, formally expresses itself in its content is expressed in the syllables and the kind of the twisting of the word as it comes yeah. out of your mouth. It's beautiful. I love, thank right. you for bringing that up. The more we can love the onomatopoeia, the, the better. Oh, absolutely. So good. So um, he's the wretched and then you turn back to Phoebe and say. Yeah, what? Though you have no beauty. As by my faith, I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed. First boffo joke of the thing, everybody no, goes right. bananas. This has yeah. coming up probably has the best punchline in the entire canon. Um, and many of you will recognize it uh, coming up, but that's the first lob. And she's starting to feel, you know, she goes right after her looks, right? Yep. Oh man, the oh, whole it's bad time. though, right? You know, and so yeah. what do you think is going on with Rosalind? Why is it so easy for her to jump on? That's what I talked about, this cruelty that comes out here, right? Yeah, well, we were, so what I was, what I love to quote from this gorgeous book by Angela Thurwell, Rosalind, but she writes, Rosalind herself is mercurial, witty, brave, uh, loving, mischievous, and cruel in all varying proportions at different times throughout the play. In other words, she has all the contradictions of an authentic person. And it's yeah. like, yeah, it's all the contradictions. And here's Ro Rosalind is trying on, she's just trying on all the different things that she right. can do now that she's male. And right. one of them is she starts off with the pangs of Sylvius, but then she, you know, takes a page out of Phoebe's book mm -hmm. and tries out what it is to be sort of like cruel and malicious a little bit. Right. Um, yeah, I was saying to you earlier, but it's like, if I could go back in time, I would find Alan Rickman and be like, can you, can you just read these punchlines out loud, please? Because to hear his voice or like Severus Snape dripping with the- Well, you won't be surprised, yeah. You won't be surprised to know, you probably do know that um, he, he's, uh, he, he did give a very famous Jaquies um, that, you know, of course, like yeah. as they say of on course. stage, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Rickman with the, you know, the greatest voice anyone's ever heard. You know, they right. actually studied his voice. His voice was studied by a, a group of scientists to figure out why it's so great. Wow. Yeah, well, I don't know. They yeah. Frequencies and who can, science. Anyway, Alan Rickman, may he rest in peace. Yeah. A great, great. Without genius. candle may go dark to bed. Yeah. Um, so good. Yeah. And then, of course, must you therefore be proud and pitiless? Real yeah. question. And yeah. of course, in our production, we had wonderful Jesse Hinson. Right. Like, I think just dropped dropped his books. Is that what he did? He just, yeah. with like the jaw drop. Right, um, so we have to get that moment, right? To that, the moment you're talking about is, when do we see as an audience, Phoebe fall in love with Rosalind as Ganymede? And in that moment, why? And it's at when she's being cruel to her, you know, it's all of a sudden it's like this anger and this, you know, the opposite of Sylvius and Sylvius is kind of vacillating romanticism comes this kind of strapping square shouldered, you know, um, a mean guy, you know, kind of yeah. homecoming king. Right. 
yeah. and she just she she be she's besotted with him immediately, even though um, he is not a, necessarily being nice. Yeah. Well, and that Rosalind knows it too. So later, much later in the scene, um, she says to Phoebe, "He's fallen." in love with your foulness mm. and then she realizes and she'll fall in love with my anger like and that's right. it right it's and right that there. gets right back to that's that's back to viola right that's her viola moment in the speech where she's all when because she has to realize that and say what does that mean what does that say about me and i have to deal with that right that that this idea of the proper false and women's wax and hearts i have to protect this or am I, or am I so in love with the feeling of being powerful that I'm willing to, um, you know, take it out on another, you know, um, it's, uh, it's part of the, the, the kind of human experience. Right. And so, but she's deep into it now. Um, and, uh, she goes and, and once she realizes here that Phoebe has fallen in love with her, she has an aside to us. So let's take it from this, from, um, uh, why, what means this, um, and just, just take a run at it. I'm going to let you go for a little bit. Sure. Why? What means this? Why do you look on me? As by my faith, I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. And then, of course, an event of some sort. Right. And you get the, hunts my little life. I think she means to tangle mine eyes too, which I love as like, it's such a regular line. I think she means to tangle mine eyes too. It's like, right. forsooth, I know not why I am so sad. Like, and tangle is interesting just because we're coming off Viola. Remember the, the end is untangle, this not, this word comes back, tangle, such a great, great word, right? Yeah, they, share, they, they both share together and trying to understand how to get out of the predicament, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think she means to tangle mine eyes too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your, and then, oh man, she's awful. Rosalind. Go ahead, go ahead. Don't, don't judge her, yeah. just say it. Go at her. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entame my spirits to your worship. Good. That's right there. So that, that, that is, you just said, you got this, you got that, you got you're the ugliest person I've ever seen in my life. And then there's a beautiful thing that comes out of it. You say you, and I don't, you can't rush by this that can entame your spirits to my worship becomes a, an actually beautiful vision of what love actually is amidst all of this ugliness of bugle eyeballs and this, you know, and so, yeah, you know, and, and there's some, a responsibility for us as actors, right. To kind of, embrace as you just pointed out from the Thurwell comment her her cruelty right the ugliness and then that in the midst of that there's this Chekhovian kind of blip of like back to Rosalind head over heels with Orlando saying what we want more than anything is to have our spirit entamed by another right yeah. but it will never be you yeah and then it gets ugly again right, right? right, right and then right. you turn your then you turn your gaze on to to uh Sylvius, yeah right and i think it is it's definitely the antithetical there um of in tame my spirits and then you look at the shepherd and it's like here's this poor guy you idiot you foolish shepherd wherefore do you follow her like foggy south puffing with wind and rain yeah it's great and then it's like Right, so yeah. pulling out the sounds of like puffing. He's yeah. so pathetic. With and it's wind so on a monopoetic there too, right? Yeah. And Shakespeare is really um, wanting us to do that. You are, and then like the, come on, dude, you are a thousand times a proper man than she, a woman. And whatever you set up, this was the lovely moment where we Casey grabbed uh, Jesse's hand and they just sort of stood next to each other and of course, the genius line, to such fools as you that make the world full of ill-favored children. Right, that's so great. And it's like, there's three jokes in this speech that kind of land like they're, they're just like, it's Jack Benny. It's just like, bang, bang, bang. And there's such great punchlines. That's the second of them, right? Which is, you see the two, you know, we call them the clowns, they're idiots, you know what I mean? Or whatever. And they're so mismatched and you just like, oh, they don't fit right. And, you know, uh, we were lucky with, as you say, with Casey and, and Jesse that we had the very, you know, they were just the exact opposites of each other and playing opposite genders as well. You know, Casey was Sylvius and Jesse was um, uh, Phoebe. So it was great, yeah. So I, before we're, we're a little low on time. So I wanna get to the third punchline here, um, which is the best of all, um, yeah. 
uh, right. uh, of time. Um, so, uh, but mistress, know yourself. Can we take it? Yeah. Can we just jump down to that? But mistress, know thyself. Know yourself. Down on your knees and thank heaven fasting for a good man's love for i must tell you friendly in your ear sell while you can you are not for all markets that's great and then the audience goes crazy and they and then we participate in rosalind's cruelty right um right. And, and well, it feels good. It's because it's a, it feels so good right and when, so we're with her then going yeah i like like sometimes putting somebody else down makes us and it's and especially when it's as wittily and as cleverly constructed as that right that we kind of go and then but we're forced to if i think later to interrogate this in a different way you know i always think phoebe is a little bit like it's easy and it's very easy once we see Phoebe be cruel to allow her to be cruelly done too. But then after a bit, it's like, maybe that's not, you know, it's like what happens to Malvolio. We see Malvolio be cruel and then he is really cruelly done for. And if the production is worth its salt, you know, we might love Festy. We might think Festy is great, but by the end we should have a little distaste in our mouth with how cruel they are and that, that, that our human capacity to revel in um, the uh, the detriment of others, right? Um, and yeah. and and Rosalind has to learn about that too. What that means in terms of and why is she feeling that like thing? It's all of a sudden she's it's like she's got more testosterone, <laughs> right? And it's really testosterone is can is great, but it also can you know too much sometimes can can lead to some some tricky things. Um, and I so think she uh, ultimately chooses to lose the mask, right? When yeah. she realizes the number of people who are hurting because of this. Yeah, yeah. Like when she realizes that it's not only Sylvia, it's not only Phoebe, but also Orlando, it's like, what am I doing? And that's when she says it's not worth it. Like, yeah. ta-da, here I am, I'm here Rosalind. I am. Yeah. Whereas Viola, it's, she doesn't really make the choice to, right. to do the mask. She's right. like, oh, hi. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess, uh, uh, record scratch. Yeah. Oh, it turns out I'm actually a woman. Right. So. Yeah, that's a great way. I mean, we're, we're going to be ending now. But yes, that I think that Rosalind, in the end, chooses to because she sees for all of the freedom that it entails, it has also it is unsustainable to not be who you are in all its totality, even as she has discovered um, that she's something she's always felt, which is the the journey, the trajectory of all drama, that I am more than the sum of my parts. And the drama allows us to explore those. This gender thing allows us to explore it in a very, very unique and powerful way. And a kind of in a lab that is um, that is intensified, right? Amplified in a very, very short period of time. She kind of grows up in front of us over the course of this play. You know, yeah, it's what drama it's the, does. It kind of speeds up time. The trouser rolls, right? It's like, that's, that's what they are. They're, you watch someone, uh, go through a, a journey, a physical and emotional journey to get to, to know themselves. Um, and then they can, once they do, they can make the commitment to someone else. Yeah, to, and to being who they are. Yeah. Nora, that's the best possible way I could think of ending. You're fantastic. <laughs> what a delight to, to work with you on this as it has been to work in rehearsals. And, and I cannot wait uh, into the, to, to, to the hopefully sooner than later that we get to do this again very, very soon. So you're, um, the, you're the greatest. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back next Friday at noon. Um, look out for the promo early next week. Uh, we thank you all for tuning in and be safe, be kind uh, and take care of each other. All right. Bye bye. Thank you so much.